I think experimental architecture is always important. In fact, we need always to have experimental architecture. It's, um, it's interesting to have experimental architecture, which is uh, often expressions of uh, interesting ideas, come into focus with, with real serious ideas. And the fact that Albert Frey could um, uh, see the possibility of making this very exciting house, something that was absolutely innovative in the United States, but it was also had this other agenda of a very serious side to show people we can make housing cost-effective housing in the areas where people are moving to the outside of cities. The Illuminate House is particularly interesting, you know, because of the, the roof terrace, the built-in garage, the use of this very bold uh, semicircular form at the entrance. Um, I mean, it, it's a very simple house, but I think that those are the most interesting aspects. The Luminaire House is extremely important because of the use of technology, its prefabricated aluminum panels, also its uh, efficiency in planning and its uh, proportional system. It, and it looked as if you could just put it anywhere. Evidently, it's not always the case because now it's trying to find a home. F.R.S. York's book, The Modern House, you know, was full of primarily, of course, of continental European examples. But there were a few American examples, and the most interesting American examples were these two houses by uh, Coker and Fry, the Illuminaire House and this other one. You must know it, this little box raised up on Dudley Columns with a spiral stair going up, a weekend house, but really just a single room. Uh, these two works were you know, made a big impression on me. You know, they were the most interesting American work at that date. You know, Fry working for Le Corbusier would have been aware of this never-ending promise of, uh, of sort of transferring from the automobile industry the idea of prefabricated uh, industrialized uh, dwelling units. And I think uh, the, the work he did with Coca uh, was, you know, uh, oriented towards that. Coker and Frey started to design the Luminaire House in 1931. They created this pavilion, which was shown at the Grand Central um, Gallery uh, for the Allied and Industrial Arts Exhibition and the Architecture League as a joint uh, uh, collaboration or sponsorship. They created this pavilion, and this was definitely part of something that Coker wanted to bring into the magazine to show more uh, how, what kind of solutions you could come up with using modern day materials such as aluminum, prefabricated panels, as we see in the L Luminaire house. He also was interested in doing using solar panels. He was interested in, in buildings out of copper, buildings out of canvas any kind of material that was coming up, concrete, concrete block that interlocked. He was very, very uh, attuned to the times, and he and Coker would work together on, on, the, on architectural schemes and then proceed to, uh, this was kind of like a moonlighting situation, and Coker would make sure that articles appeared in the magazine. Coker did not write, per se, on his own architecture that was looked on as a little bit of a conflict of interest and still is. Architecture, I've been using modern art, there was much more criticism in the newspapers or in even art journals and some of the other literary uh, journals, but not so much in the architectural magazines. The magazines were advocating education. They were trying to change architectural education in the States. They were trying to get people used to new information about 
architecture and design and planning. And they're trying, as, as uh, Lawrence Coker said later, they were trying to improve society through planning. They were trying to make better buildings. They were trying to improve the health of society. And this was the way to do it. They took it very seriously. And they started even building types. Um, we, Architecture Record, still runs building types. It started in the late 20s uh, in, in one of its, uh, the issues where they would analyze, take a certain building type, like say uh, a school building, and analyze everything new that had happened in that and show three or four or five different examples. We still do that. It's still around. We won't give that tradition up because that's an architectural record tradition. Came uh, to America on, on September 5, 1930, um, by boat, of course, <laughs> because there were no planes flying at that time. <laughs> I came on a very fast line that it, the um, Bremen of the German uh, uh, ship, uh, which took only about five and a half days. And um, I was in third class because I didn't have enough money to go second or first. So that meant I had to go by way of all Ellis Island. The higher class didn't have to go there. So out, out in the harbor of New York, they took me off the boat, um, took us all on a little um, boat and, and took us over to Ellis Island. Of course, before coming to this country, I had to have a doctor's certificate that didn't have disease or anything, and, and uh, they were very strict to let you in this country. But it didn't take much time <laughs> at Ellis Island. Um, I, w I was in good shape, and so the, the same uh, day I got back to New York. Well, the first week I came to New York, I went to see Les Goss and first, and he said he may, he was doing the Philadelphia, Philadelphia Savings Fund Society building at that time. He was associated with George Howe. And, and um, he said he may have some work. And then after I saw Les Goss, I went to see um, um, Coker. And he hired me on the spot. He was managing editor of the Architectural Record magazine. And um, he had done um, some architectural work on the side all along. And it so happened that a, a German, I think his name was Gerhard Ziegler, had worked with him on project. Uh, he did a, a house in Upper New York for Rex Stout, the author, and, and um, he had done other work. So he, he, um, it happened that I came at the right time, so he needed someone. I um, used the techniques of, of um, the American uh, building industry. Uh, which is very advanced at that time, more than any other country. I mean, the, the industrial production of, of this country, prefabricated materials and so on. And, and um, but I used the, um, my knowledge of design that I learned in Europe with Le Corbusier, I mean, to analyze everything. And Coker, being at the record, got knowledge of everything uh, knew that came about, you see, to be uh, featured in, in, the, in the magazine. It was interesting the way the Illuminaire came about. There's a, every year there's this exhibition at Grand Central Palace in New York of, of um, building materials, and, and then the Architectural League of New York has, has a show too at the same time. So the um, manager of the exhibition asked him to think of something that would attract the public because they don't just go around and look at building materials, not very interesting. So we conceived the idea to build a whole house in there, which would interest everything. And so since the hall is high enough, we could have a three-story house, which of course was inspired by Le Corbusier's uh, idea, you know, like I think I was inspired by uh, the Illuminaire house, by the um, single family house at uh, Stuttgart. So that gave me the idea because it had a roof garden and had a space underneath uh, like a porch. So we designed that, of course, using the American te technology of metal and, and uh, glass and so on. And it had to be prefabricated 
because there was only a couple of weeks between exhibitions in which it could be built. So everything had to be repaired and we got the Aluminum Company of America to donate uh, all the aluminum and then Trotskon donated their uh, floor decking and, and uh, windows and so on and, uh, and then some other costs were made up um, by, by uh, other companies. Wallace Harrison um, obviously attended the exhibition and uh, at the end of it he bought the house uh, for it's said to be a thousand dollars and uh, moved it to a recently purchased uh, property that he had out in uh, uh, Long Island uh, on the edge of uh, Syosset and Huntington uh, and um, his intention was to uh, use it as a, a summer house and he um, began to put it together So it went on for, it seems, about a year, uh, but then I guess uh, business was good and he started to add on to uh, that house very quickly. And there are some images uh, a year later with uh, some additions. Wallace Harrison's own architecture didn't particularly look like the Illuminaire house, but he was a very committed modernist. He really believed that architecture had to continually invent itself all the time. Uh, he was also a very pragmatic man. He did a lot of things that a lot of people questioned because they involved a lot of political compromise. But he believed in getting it done. And he brought a significant amount of creativity to what he did. And so, Harrison's connection to the Luminaire House was, was more of a conceptual one than a literal one. It wasn't that it sort of it looked like his buildings. It's just that he spotted it. And Harrison was always an interesting talent spotter, too. That was one of his, his gifts. Well, Harrison um, uh, sold the house uh, to uh, the Diamond uh, family, who were art dealers. And uh, after uh, some time, it was sold again to uh, a, a doctor who decided he wanted to tear the house down so he could develop the property into a number of other houses. Uh, and at that point, he took out a demolition permit. Word spread very quickly uh, in the news that uh, it was going to be uh, torn down. And they were looking for ways to save it. And so we at New York Institute of Technology, where I just began teaching, decided we could take the house if it was given to us and move it with our students to our new campus in central Iceland. Taking the house down was a lot of fun, and that group uh, really enjoyed it. But the, um, the first thing we had to do in Islip, after we got a building permit and the site was chosen, was to build the, the foundation. So one whole semester was dedicated to digging uh, four feet down into the ground and putting in the foundations so that uh, uh, we could start to re-erect the house. planning to have a um, some kind of celebration on its 60th birthday. We thought 
that was uh, wonderful. And it was just at the moment that we were, had built a lot of the frame up so we could actually uh, show the building to people that we might invite to, to uh, celebrate this event. So we um, invited a number of, of people to come and have dinner with us and to talk briefly about the house. And our great coup was that we got uh, Philip Johnson to, to come out and see the house. Albert Fry was known to me as Albert. And uh, last time I saw him was in Palm Springs. And he was seen most blissfully happy to be out of the rat race and happy at last in the desert that he loved so much. And uh, I didn't envy him, but I see what he means now. <laughs> He's even older than I am, so we're having a lot of fun, but I'm still in the rat race, and I love the rat race. I can't understand going to the desert and sitting there in a little house, modern house, in the middle of the desert. What do you do there? <laughs> well, it's much more fun to make an expedition to something called Islip. I must say a town I never, I never heard of. And, uh, I, if you, somebody told me it was two hours away, I probably wouldn't have come. <laughs> but it was, it was irresistible. Uh, Fry, of course, was a, a pupil of, of, of Corbusier's, and I must say that Hitchcock and I uh, didn't really appreciate the fine points of the architecture of the building. What we loved very much was the technical side, but most of all, what we admired and, 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 and celebrated in that house, it got built. It was fascinating when Philip Johnson came out to Islip to visit the event. He didn't talk at length, but he spoke a little bit and he said, you know, when the first house was first in the league exhibition, I didn't see it because I was out on the street with a placard that said, boycott this exhibition. They, they hate modern architecture. But there inside the exhibition was the Illuminaire House, this 27-foot uh, tall uh, piece of modern architecture. So it was a fascinating piece of history. The issue about uh, the next phase of the Luminaire House is uh, also uh, complicated. Uh, the New York Institute of Technology decided to close down its uh, central Islip uh, campus uh, in uh, 2005. And uh, so that left the Luminaire House uh, with nothing around it uh, but abandoned buildings. And from uh, that, we realized that there wasn't uh, uh, very good security. Uh, so we, had, we were a little bit worried about the house. But we also uh, uh, had to find a new place for it. So we spent uh, several years with uh, small leads and possibilities to, to put it uh, in one place or another, none of them being very successful until we um, found what we thought was a perfect site for the house in uh, Sunnyside uh, Gardens, uh, Queens. A historic district where uh, the Sunnyside Gardens project of uh, uh, Wright and Stein uh, housing uh, groups, multiple blocks of housing that were very much like what Albert uh, Frey and Lawrence Coker were talking about with a perimeter block with uh, shared space inside. Uh, and uh, uh, also on the site or adjacent to the Sunnyside Gardens was one of the important new early uh, housing projects uh, also by uh, Stein, um, the Phipps Houses. And across from the Phipps Houses was a vacant lot, a playground that had been uh, abandoned for more than a decade and had been recently purchased by a person who wanted to develop it and we went to the developer, we said, uh, we'd like to uh, work jointly with you to put the house on your property, design you some apartment units, uh, and make a, a beautiful ensemble, uh, and we could uh, have a, a great location for the Illuminaire House to be a museum again. Uh, Community Board 2 was extremely upset. They had heard about it. They had uh, made uh, a, a lot of conversation in the neighborhood. They got a lot of people against it. And we had a terrible evening at Community Board 2, presenting the house to a bunch of people who had already clearly made up their mind they didn't want it. 
and they brought uh, public officials to also hear their opinions and, and voice their own. We spent three to four years working on uh, uh, that proposal. Uh, our problem was that no one would entertain the idea of aluminum in a brick neighborhood. In fact, the, uh, the uh, assemblyman from the neighborhood said it was like a spaceship landing from above into their neighborhood. I don't think Sunnyside Garden is a landmark museum. I think Sunnyside Garden is a residential community, residential neighborhood where people live and raise their families and enjoy their personal life. I don't appreciate, I, I don't like the idea really of tourist groups walking up and down the street looking for the Illuminaire House. It's important for these buildings to be appropriate. And appropriate can mean many things. So we thought that the, the 1931 Illuminaire House was appropriate for this historic district, even though, yes, this was metal and the historic district was a brick and masonry. Um, and that while it didn't quote unquote match the architecture of Sunnyside Gardens, we felt that it suited the site. What we questioned was the new housing on the site, which we thought certainly could have been tweaked. Well, preserving modernism has been a tough sell from the beginning. Okay. Uh, some, sometimes because people still think of it as recent, even though a lot of modernism is now historic and old, and the Illuminaire House itself is you know, past 80 years old already. Nevertheless, the idea that a modern building is historic is something that a lot of people have a hard time getting their heads around, basically. That's part of it. Another thing is that many modern buildings were not all that beloved. Some were, but not all. And so there's a lot of negative associations with modernism. So you put all that together, yes, modernism and preservation as a combination are a tough sell, definitely. The idea of historic preservation, at least in New York City, is to protect the city that the residents, the architects, the planners, to protect what we love about the city. There are certain parts of the city that have history, architecture, or cultural significance that it would be a shame to lose. Now, Sunnyside Gardens is one of the most historic planned communities in the United States. It was a conscious reflection of the Garden City movement that began in England at the turn of the 20th century. The idea of Sunnyside Gardens was to create this example of what urban living could be, a more human, humane experience for families. I agree completely that Sunnyside Gardens is one of the most important garden, urban garden city communities in the United States and a great achievement in the the history of utopian housing in New York. But it was about creating a new kind of place, and it was filled with the spirit of the new. And so I always thought the Illuminaire House and Sunnyside Gardens were kind of a good match for that reason. So it's not that Sunnyside Gardens isn't special. It is special. It's incredible. But the very things that made it special to me made the Illuminaire House a good match for it because they were both places in which an architect searched for a creative response to a 20th century challenge about housing. The Luminaire House project was presented to the full board um, as well. So everyone, there are 50 people on the community board and everybody had an opportunity to hear about the proposal, see what it was about, and to vote. People had a variety of reasons. Um, people voted against it because they didn't like the Illuminaire House. They voted against it because they didn't like the houses, uh, the, 
the design of the homes that were associated with the Illuminar House project. Um, they voted against it because they wanted to preserve the existing park that's there. I never thought the Illuminar House would be as jarring as people perceived it would be though because of its scale. And I always thought that the idea of putting that jewel on the corner was going to give us more open space to the street than any solution that would have put an L-shaped housing project on that lot, which is, you know, the natural thing that would happen. So I actually thought the Illuminar House and massing also was going to be beneficial to that particular site by having the housing frame it and have the jewel sitting in the front like in a park, like it should be in sort of a park-like setting. I thought it would give more to the community. When the, the Luminaire House was proposed to be located in Sunnyside Gardens, there was really n not a good plan for public access, for maintenance. There was no committed endowment for taking care of it, and so I personally had huge concerns about that. The property itself is not an income-producing piece of property. It would be something that, you know, in addition to needing a program that might establish a relationship with the people who live in the community, uh, every year you got to wash the windows. Every year you have to have a, a, a property super, or property maintenance. Sunnyside could use a object of sculpture like the Luminaire House. Uh, it would help, uh, not help, but it would become part of the community's identity. And I think that would not have been a bad thing. And I thought that it was being placed in a context of uh, new housing that was sensitive to it and it was sort of a little jewel. I think the lessons for the Illuminaire House are more relevant today in 2014 than they've been for years. I think it's really important for us, government, not-for-profits, architects, the people of, of our city to stand together and figure out beautiful ways to provide affordable housing for real New Yorkers. I hope it has a place in New York City. I mean, the Illuminaire House is one of our more important pieces of modern architecture, one of the earliest pieces of modern architecture in New York, uh, done by an important architect, owned for many years by another important architect. If we can't save that, you know, it ought to be easier to save because it's little. Uh, you know, we, we, it would be a great shame if we lost it. It would be a, a huge loss for architecture, really. And it, 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 if we could only save it and restore it, it would be a reminder to so many people of how creative modernism could be at its best, how responsive it was to problem solving, how Albert Frey, way back in 1931, was foreshadowing prefabrication and thinking of the house as you know, a, a mechanical structure, but that would enable a, a good and civilized life. It's a wonderful and important house and, and it really deserves to be saved.